I'd like to begin with Shevchenko's first translator, his friend Alexei Plushchev. In 1860, he wrote to their mutual friend, novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky, about the difficulty of conveying the beauty of the poet's original Ukrainian verses in Russian. I recently translated Shevchenko's poem, The Hireling. I don't know how the translation came out, but the original is a wonderfully poetic thing. It's hard to translate. It's simple, natural, and straight from the heart. Incredibly so. It is all the more difficult to translate Shevchenko into a non-Slavic language such as English, which does not have many of the linguistic mechanisms of Ukrainian, particularly diminutives for nouns and even adverbs. Shevchenko uses them routinely to underscore sympathy or sarcasm. Regarding his complicated meter, I simply used Anapest throughout for the sake of flow. As I wrote in the introduction to my book, I have opted for a translation that focuses on Shevchenko's content, which is as compelling as his poems are lyrical. They are alternately frightening, funny, despairing, hopeful, sacred, and sacrilegious, but always illuminating and entertaining. They serve not only as a guide to long-submerged, even prohibited elements of Ukrainian history, geography, personalities, and folklore, but also to universal themes of love, envy, oppression, and freedom. It is safe to say that a majority of Ukrainians learned about Shevchenko from an early age. Personally, I can't remember when I first heard of the poet, but I know it was early. Here's a photo of my parents, brothers, and me, taken when I was four or five years old by the bust of Shevchenko at the Ukrainian Cultural Garden on Martin Luther King Boulevard right here in Cleveland. The original plaster cast is on display at the Ukrainian Museum Archives in the Tremont neighborhood. In June 1964, I was among tens of thousands of Ukrainians from around the world to witness former President Dwight Eisenhower unveil the statue of Shevchenko in Washington, D.C. There are about 125 in other cities around the world and roughly 1,250 in the poet's native Ukraine. Here are several in the cities currently or previously occupied by Russian invaders. Bucha, Donetsk, Kherson, Luhansk, Mariupol, and Sevastopol. The one in Borodyanka, north of Kyiv, was shot through the head by a Russian soldier in the very first days of the full-scale war last year. Thankfully, the poet was symbolically treated for the gunshot by a local activist soon after Russians were pushed out of the area. Here are some of the Shevchenko monuments in world capitals. Beijing, Budapest, Buenos Aires, Copenhagen, Havana, Moscow, Paris, Tashkent, and Warsaw. There is no accurate count on how many editions of Shevchenko's Kobzar have been published, but a tally in 1976 put the number at 110 during the Soviet period alone. With pre- and post-Soviet editions in Ukraine and abroad, the number could easily top 300. And yet, Shevchenko remains largely unknown to non-Ukrainians around the world. How is that? I suggest an answer in the introduction to my book. I also note that, unfortunately, it is the only complete version of Shevchenko's poetry collection in English. That is not to claim special credit or to disparage his previous translators, whose work I admire and often referred to. It is instead grudging recognition of the Kremlin's remarkable ability not only to have inhibited Ukrainian intellectual activity, but to have kept a country as large as Ukraine invisible to the outside world. It did so through prolonged enslavement, isolation, and the slaughter of Ukrainians by the millions through the murder, character assassination, exile, or co-opting of the country's leaders, through selective revisions of history to deny Ukrainians their past, as well as Tsar's bans against the literary use of Ukrainian and Soviet pressure to muzzle the language. Most Ukrainians know at least a few lines of Shevchenko's poetry, including the opening stanza of his very first poem called Prichinda, the Mad Maiden. It sets the scene for a story that takes place between moonrise and dawn, when the so-called third rooster crows 
to signal the end of the witching hour. It is in the dead of night that a young maiden is driven out of her mind because her lover seems to have been lost in a distant war. It was Shevchenko's first published poem, though it did not appear in the first edition of his poetry collection, the Kobzar. The mighty Dnieper roars and groans, an angry wind resounds. It bends tall willows to the ground. It raises waves like mountains. A pale moon just then peeked through the passing clouds, and like a boat in azure seas, it rolled and pitched across the sky. Third roosters had not crowed, and nowhere was a soul astir. The owls called out across the grove, at times an ash tree creaked. Shotenko was born on March 9, 1814, into serfdom, a cruel social order which allowed one human being to own others. To escape it, Shevchenko had to be purchased from his owner, Pavel Engelhardt, a Russian nobleman and officer. A bit more about that later. Taras's mother died when he was nine, and his father just two years later. He was a so-called chumak, who hauled goods on an ox cart. Today, he might have been known as a truck driver. Shevchenko mentions his parents in a poem directed at out-of-touch gentlemen, who idealized village life as a quiet paradise. I call it not a paradise, that cottage in a grove above the pristine pond along the village edge. There my mother swaddled me, singing as she swaddled, easing all her tedium through her little child. In that grove within that hut in paradise, I witnessed hell itself, bondage, crushing labor, and they leave no time to pray. That's where poverty and drudgery sent my mother, still quite young, to an early grave. There, my father, crying with his children, and we were small and bare, could not endure the cruel fate and also died in servitude. Upon the father's passing, Taras bounced around from home to home and ended up as a boy servant here in Engelhardt's Manor. When Shevchenko was 15, his owner moved to Vilno, today's capital of Lithuania, Vilnius, and took the teenager with him. Thanks to a Polish girlfriend he met during his 18 months in Vilnius, Shevchenko became aware that he and other Ukrainians were slaves. The girlfriend, Yedviga or Dunya Husakovska, was also an orphan, but she lived freely with her aunt. While Shevchenko had to deal with the whims and wishes of his owner, Dunya could do what she pleased. The next stop for Engelhardt and his human property was the imperial capital, St. Petersburg, where a group of intellectuals recognized Shevchenko's talent as an artist and arranged to purchase his freedom. This is his emancipation certificate, or you might say, the purchase receipt. Exploiting such keen interest in his human, Pavel Engelhardt bid up the price to a hefty 2,500 rubles, an amount that an ordinary person could comfortably live on for as much as eight years. Once free, Shevchenko was accepted into the St. Petersburg Academy of Arts, where he became the favorite student of Karl Brulow, perhaps the empire's most famous painter of the time. He also discovered and began to develop his talent for poetry. At the age of 24, Shevchenko published his first eight poems in a booklet called The Kobzar, which means Wandering Minstrel or Troubadour, though it needed approval from censors. Nonetheless, it was an instant popular and critical success. This is an excerpt from the first poem in the first edition of The Kobzar. My thoughts, my thoughts, troubled is my life with you. Why have you stood on paper in a sad array? Why has the wind not scattered you like dust across the steppe? Why has trouble not consoled you as it would its child? For trouble has, as if by jest, brought you here into this world. Tears have watered you. Why did they not engulf you, not sweep you out to sea or wash you far afield? People would not ask what hurts, nor why I curse my fate, or why I roam the world. Doing nothing, they'd not say derisively, 
O oh, my blossoms, O oh, my children, why have I so loved you? Why have I so cared for you? Will a single heart in this wide world cry for you as I? Perhaps I've guessed. Perhaps I'll come across a girlish heart and hazel eyes that will cry about these thoughts. I do not wish for more. A single tear from hazel eyes and I'll become the Lord of Lords. My thoughts, my thoughts, troubled is my life with you. The thoughts Shevchenko put on paper were nothing compared to the real trouble he would get into later for challenging the social injustice he saw in Ukraine. But many of his early poems, nonetheless, were apolitical, and throughout the Kubzar, nature is alive. Trees bend to hear the sweet nothings of lovers. The moon and stars converse, as does the wind with meadows or the sea. Here's an early poem in which a girl pleads with the wind. Raging wind, O oh, raging wind, you talk with the sea. Awaken it and play with it. Ask the azure sea. It knows where my sweetheart is because it carried him. It will answer, yes, the azure sea will answer where it's hidden him. If it drown my sweetheart, blow the sea apart. I'll go find my sweetheart. I'll go drown my sorrow. I'll drown all of my misfortune and turn into a nymph. I'll search among the dark, dark waves. I'll sink down to the bottom. I will find him. I'll embrace him and swoon upon his heart. The Kobzar, which expanded to almost 250 poems, is the stuff of life, tightly packed with events, landscapes, ideas, images, and personalities, both historical and fictional. Many are footnoted in my book so the reader can appreciate the context. To be honest, the poetry collection vividly depicts a lot of darkness. War, murder, rape, unwed mothers, betrayal, homelessness, and the like but no more than you see on the evening news today. But no less vividly, Shevchenko always conveys hope, love, beauty, and justice, and they, he believed, will prevail in the end. So, how did a serf from a small Ukrainian village gain the wisdom for which he is remembered? For one, he traveled widely throughout Ukraine before there were cars, trains, or planes. Between the ages of 29 and 31, he covered all of the places you see in white. He was serving as an artist on an archaeological expedition, documenting landmarks, burial mounds, traditions, and songs. And this being a library, I'd like to focus a bit on Shevchenko's love of books as a source of his wisdom and information. As an orphan, Shevchenko often read the Book of Psalms in village church services and at funerals. Shevchenko subsequently had access to a wide array of books. His owner's wife, Sophia Engelhardt, whose husband is remembered as a selfish jerk, gave Taras access to a large family library whenever the owner was away. Later, as a well-known poet and painter, he was a welcome guest among the rich and poor alike. When he stayed in wealthy manners, he spent a lot of time reading books in their libraries. A sampling from 27 pages of footnotes from his novellas indicate his breadth of knowledge. On these two pages alone, he cites, among others, German writer Karl Eckershausen, French novelist Alexander Dumas, Homer, Horatio, Virgil, Ukrainian writers Evhen Hrebinka and Petro Hulak Artemovsky, German poet and playwright Friedrich Schiller. He was also familiar with such classics as Herodotus, Plutarch, Virgil, Ovid, and Levy, as well as Dante, Goethe, Dumas, Balzac, Byron, Jules Verne, and Dickens. Inspired by Shakespeare, Shevchenko made this engraving of King Lear. In exile, the poet was sent a Russian translation of the English bard's complete works, but they were confiscated. After his release in 1857, he became friends with Shakespeare translator Nikolai Ketcher, who gave him another set. In late 1860, Shevchenko appeared for a reading on the stage of this concert hall in St. Petersburg with several well-known writers, including novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky, who attended Shevchenko's funeral a few months later. Decades earlier, Shevchenko composed a poetic eulogy upon the death of Ivan Kotlerovsky, 
the author of The Aeneid, a lighthearted rendition of Virgil's epic. Written in 1798, it was the first book in the Ukrainian vernacular and remains a classic. The poem is entitled In Everlasting Memory of Kodorovsky. He's now silent, the poor fellow, and he's orphaned all the seas and mountains that he was first to wander, where the vagabond dragged his crew along. All is gone and all is sad, just like the ruins of Troy. All is sad, just glory beams with sunlight. The Kobzar will not die, for glory hails him forever. You will, dear father, reign as long as there are people. Till the sun shines in the sky, you'll never be forgotten. However, the majority of Ukrainians in Shevchenko's time were serfs who were kept illiterate. There were also Russian prohibitions against publishing books in Ukrainian. In a sweeping missive to his fellow countrymen, he called upon the wealthy to share and take pride in their Ukrainian identity and the poor to learn. Fool not yourselves, learn, read, and study what is foreign, but don't forsake your own. Shuchenko promoted Ukrainian education with a primer that he wrote and published for schoolchildren at his own expense shortly before he passed away. It covered the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, as well as prayers. The greatest influence on Shuchenko by far was the Bible, which he referred to throughout his life and carried in exile. He wrote a number of poems with sentiments and visions directly based on books of the Bible, Hosea, Ezekiel, the Psalms of David, Isaiah, John, and others. He also prefaced many poems with specific verses. The Caucasus, for example, is introduced with Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 1. Oh, that my head were waters, and mine eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain. Shochenko dedicated this powerful poem to Yaakov de Balmain, a close friend who transcribed the Kobzar into Latin letters to make it more accessible in Poland. De Maman died in an ambush in 1845 during Russia's invasion of Chechnya. Shertenko sets the scene to the Caucasus with a reference to Prometheus, who symbolizes the unquenchable human desire for freedom. The mythological figure is near the base of the Shertenko Monument in Washington, D.C., Mountains beyond mountains, shrouded in clouds, seeded by grief and showered with blood. Since time immemorial, it is there that an eagle has punished Prometheus. Each God-given day it pecks at his ribs and pierces the heart that's within. Pierces, yet it can't drink vital blood that is spilled. The heart pulses again, and again it knows laughter. Our soul does not perish, nor does freedom expire. Nor can the greedy plough any field in the murky abyss of an ocean. The poem features a famous line, Fight, you'll win the fight, that continues to inspire Ukrainians to persevere in their struggle for freedom. These are just a few renditions of that phrase from the current war. Bill Clinton used it in his last visit to Kiev as president in 2000, and former U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine Marie Yovanovitch cited the line last year on the Stephen Colbert Show. It was also emblazoned on the flag jacket of this Ukrainian soldier defending against Russian invaders eight years ago in eastern Ukraine. Another example of biblical verses as introductions is The Witch, a poem that cites the 55th Psalm, verse 15. Let death seize upon them, and let them go down quick into hell for wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. You might think, therefore, it's a poem about retribution, but it's actually one of forgiveness, even for abhorrent sins committed by the so-called witch's evil master. He is a heartless man who abuses her, swaps their illegitimate daughter for a greyhound, and loses their bastard son in a game of cards. On his deathbed, he asks to see this haggard woman. Though she knows the healing arts, he is too sick to be saved. She came, stood at his feet, then softly read our father for the sinner's sake. The Lord seemed to awaken, looked around and at her, then shouted, 
No need, no need, be off. Or, wait, have you not forgotten? Forgive me, forgive me. And for the first time ever, tears glistened in his eyes. I forgive. I forgave you long ago. And in his hands she placed a candle, then crossed herself for him. The foe before her fell asleep just like a little child, leaving her to pray for him and his eternal soul. The forgiving spirit of the Bible pervades the Kobzar. Shevchenko wrote two versions of a favorite of mine, the soldiers well, one before and the other after exile. It's about a serf named Maxim, who works hard, wins freedom, gets married, buys land, only to fall victim to envy. He loses his wife, his fortune, and his leg in combat after being grafted into the Russian army. Nonetheless, he never loses the Christian spirit of forgiveness. In the second version, Maxim's story is told by a convict who is racked with guilt for murdering him. Listen, here's how Satan leads our soul astray. If there's no awareness or return to God, he'll sink his claws into the heart. So listen up, my son, about Maxim the righteous. It so happened that he never rested, and on Sundays or some holiday, he'd take the holy psalter in his hands and read it in the orchard. In the orchard, in the shade, is where they buried Katerina. That's the kind of righteous man that lived here in this world. And on weekdays, he won't just sit around the house. He'll poke around the yard instead. Gotta work, he'll say at times in soldier talk, or you'll put on weight just lying round the house. And so he took a spade and shovel, went into the field, and began to dig a well. May it be, he says, someday people will drink water from this well and say prayers to the Lord for my sinful soul. Another book that heavily influenced Shevchenko was called Historia Rusiv, or History of Ruthenians, which is what Ukrainians were called in the past. The book is thought to have been written in the late 18th or early 19th centuries, and is sometimes attributed to Orthodox Archbishop Georgi Koniski, who died at the age of 77 in 1795. The work covers Ukrainian history from ancient times, but mainly the period of the so-called Hetmanate, a Ukrainian Kozak state during the 17th and 18th centuries. The Tsar's regime initially banned the book, but it circulated among Ukrainian intellectuals in handwritten copies. It was finally published in 1846 by Shevchenko's friend, Ukrainian scholar Osip Bojansky. Shevchenko relied on the book to exalt or lament Cossacks who fought for Ukrainian freedom. For example, the book describes how Moscow leveled the Cossack capital of Baturin in 1708, massacring its every man, woman, and child. In his well-known poem, The Great Vault, one of three birds, now souls, talk about the sins they committed when they were human. God is not allowing them into paradise until Moscow excavates the great vault, in other words, Ukraine. One of them says, And I was not allowed, my sisters, for watering the horse that the Tsar of Muscovy mounted in Baturin on his way to Moscow from Poltava. I was still a minor when Moscow late at night burned the famed Baturin, killing Chechel, drowning youngsters and the old in the Sema River. I rolled among the corpses in Mazeppa's mansions. With me were my sister and my mother, butchered, holding one another and lying right beside me. Forcefully, yes, forcefully, they tore me from my lifeless mother. Oh, how I pleaded with the Russian captain to take my life as well. No, they did not kill me, releasing me instead to be a plaything. For the soldiers. Shevchenko referred to an account in the history of Ruthenians for another poem called Night of Taras, which tells the story of a 1630 Ukrainian peasant revolt against Poland. It was led by Taras Fedorovich, a Ukrainian hetman known as Tresilo, that is, the one who jolts or shakes others. The sun set beyond the hill and stars dressed up the sky. Then the Cossacks, like a cloud, surrounded all the Poles. 
When the moon took front and center, a cannon opened fire. The noble Poles and lords awoke, finding not a place to turn. The noble Poles and lords awoke, but could not rise from bed. The sun had set, and the Polish lords and nobles were all mown down and dead. The Alta, like a bloody serpent, carries news for ravens to fly in from fields to eat the noble Poles and lords. In flew ravens to arouse the high and mighty. So too did the Cossacks meet in prayer to the Lord. Lest anyone think Shochenko was anti-Polish, he was not. He knew Polish, had good Polish friends, and wrote a poem about brotherhood with Poles. He also condemned the bloodshed he describes in his longest poem, The Heidemachs, a cinemagraphic account of another violent peasant uprising against Polish overlords in 1768. In a prose comment following that poem, he wrote, Thank God it's over, especially when you recall that we are children of the same mother, that we are all Slavs. It pains the heart, but the story must be told. Let the sons and grandchildren know that their parents were mistaken. Let them again be brothers with their enemies. One of Shuchenko's most consequential poems was The Dream, in which he imagines soaring over Russia and describing the misery he sees below. The poem's most consequential line is thought to be derived from French aristocrat the Marquis de Coustin, whose book about Russia, Empire of the Tsar, was very similar in scope to his contemporary Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America. De Coustin's book was republished in the United States in 1989. One of the editors was former First Lady Jackie Kennedy Onassis. It is believed that there were no more than 10 or 15 copies of the work in Russia, and it appears Shevchenko had access to it. Ustan described the Empress as extremely thin. A nervous convulsion agitated every feature of her face and caused her head to slightly shake. Faded before her time and so weak, it is said she cannot live long. Shotenko's description, At his side the poor Zarina, like a dried-out mushroom, skinny, leggy, and the wretch, for added grief, has a wobbly head. That depiction didn't go over well with the Zarina's husband, Tsar Nicholas I. The autocrat personally prohibited the poet from writing or painting on top of a sentence in exile with the military for membership in a brotherhood that promoted Ukrainian autonomy. Shevchenko was first sent about 1,100 miles as the crow flies to the city of Orenburg on the banks of the Ural River that divides Europe and Asia. In 2010, I saw both of the homes he stayed in there. Unfortunately, this one was leveled in 2016 in a wanton act of cultural destruction to put up a parking lot for a bank next door. The other home still stands and is a private residence. The poet stayed there with a friend who was the quartermaster of their military unit. Shevchenko had initially ignored the Tsar's prohibition and wrote of life in exile and of dear Ukraine. I count the days and nights in bondage and forget the count. Oh Lord, how hard the days go by. And among them flow the years, drifting quietly, seizing good and evil. They take, returning nothing evermore. There are no words in distant bondage. There are no words, there are no tears. What exists is nothing. Even God Almighty can't be found beside you. There's not a thing to look at, not a soul to talk with. You have no will to live, yet you must live alone. I must, I must, but why? To not lose the soul? It's not worth the grief. Here's why I must live on earth and drag my chains in bondage. Perhaps I'll see Ukraine again. The writing came to an end in 1850, when he was betrayed by this man, Mikola Isaev, a fellow Ukrainian and officer, who was having an adulterous affair with the quartermaster's wife. Shuchenko felt obligated to tell his friend about it. Isayev retaliated by informing authorities that the poet had violated the Tsar's prohibition. 
And how did he know? Shochenko had drawn this portrait of him. He was thrown into this jail cell, which I also visited in 2010. It is part of a museum in Orenburg dedicated to the famous poet. The arrest resulted in 500 more miles of punishing travel to the desolate eastern shore of the Caspian Sea. Though he did not write any poems for seven years, he was still an artist on scouting missions that covered yet 500 more miles of straight line distance as far as Kazakhstan's Aral Sea. He had aged considerably in those 10 years and did not challenge authority directly upon release. But he most certainly hinted at it in a poem called The Neophytes about the first Christians in ancient Rome. Shevchenko assured readers with a wink wink that it was not about Russian autocrats. Not in our land, beloved by God, not under rule of czars or hetmans, but an idolatrous Roman land did this lawlessness transpire, perhaps under Decius the emperor or under Nero's stewardship. Exactly, I can't say. Let's say under Nero. Russia then did not exist. Excerpts from the neophytes are carved in stone beneath his monument in Rome about its first Christians. Shevchenko's descriptions of the city, Romans, and the Colosseum suggest he was influenced by Edward Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Shevchenko's art professor had a set in French translation, and the poet's roommate at the Academy of Arts read an abridged version to him. Gibbon, for example, writes how those around Caesar flattered the emperor through deification, that is, turning him into a living god. Here it is in Gibbon. Roman magistrates were very frequently adored as provincial deities with the pomp of altars and temple, of festivals and sacrifices. The imperious spirit of the first Caesar too easily consented to assume during his lifetime a place among the tutelar deities of Rome. Shevchenko's rendition, There's a holiday in Rome, a major holiday. Caesar comes himself with his entourage in tow. Caesar's now a cast bronze statue that they carry up in front. This uncertain holiday was contrived by nobles, by patricians, and Caesar's clever senate. They, you see, praise Caesar in every sort of manner, till it became repugnant for them to praise the fool. So they decided at a council to simply call the emperor Jupiter himself. And they wrote to every governor throughout the Roman Empire, like this. Caesar's God, superior to God. And they had a sculptor cast Caesar out of bronze. To that they added, nota bene, that the Caesar will show mercy. Not to spoil the story, I'll just say the poem's main character is a pagan mother who counts on the emperor's mercy for her son, one of the persecuted first Christians marched into the Colosseum. To better appreciate Shevchenko's poetry, the reader needs to understand that he was a very accomplished painter and wrote marvelous word pictures as well. For example, an unnamed 1849 poem written in exile in which he recalls his native village and parents. He refers here to Saturn, the Roman god of agriculture, harvests, and time. The valley, field, and the poplars, plus a willow by the well. It leaned over like the lonely sadness of confinement in a distant land. A pond, a little dam, and by the grove a windmill with its beating wings. And a verdant oak, like a Kozak, steps out from the grove to dance beneath the hill. Upon that hill's a somber garden, and in that garden, in its shade, my old folks lie as if in Eden. The oaken crosses are now tilted, inscriptions scrubbed by rain. But Saturn's smooth erasures are not the work of rain alone, nor are words his only object. May my old folks rest in peace with saints. Shevchenko painted this watercolor at the godforsaken Novopetrovsk fortress on the eastern shore of the Caspian Sea, where he spent seven of his ten years in exile. He also painted Kazakhstan's barren landscape with words that tell the story of a woodsman who stole a magical axe from behind God's door. It slipped his grasp 
and chopped down all but one of the country's trees. They caught fire, burned for seven years, and obscured the sun. On the eighth year, on a summer Sunday, the sacred sun came out like a doll in bright white lace. Where once there was a town or village, a desert stood, tinted like a swarthy gypsy. The charred remains no longer glowed. Winds swept away the ashes. Not a blade of grass was left. Tottering alone amid the steppe stood a green and single tree. Scattered in a reddened desert lay baked shards and ruddy clay. In Shevchenko's time, there were no cell phone cameras or social media to easily share images of what he experienced. But his art reaches across time to give us an idea of who and what caught his eye. Next, a five and a half minute sampling of Shevchenko's watercolors, sketches, etchings, and portraits of friends, ordinary folks, and wealthy patrons.
Shevchenko painted this self-portrait just a couple months before he died of heart failure at the age of 47. He left behind hundreds of paintings and a number of novellas and plays with additional poems that are not in the Kobzar. It is quite a feat when you consider that he was a free man for only 13 years. He was initially buried in St. Petersburg, but friends honored his wish that his final resting place be atop a mound on a bluff overlooking the Dnipro River in Ukraine. Reburial was a difficult and expensive endeavor that attests to the love and respect Shevchenko enjoyed in life and ever since. The grave has been a Ukrainian pilgrimage site since the 19th century through Soviet times and today. The cross was replaced by a statue of the poet in 1939. I was there twice in 1969 and 2014 when I took this photo. I'll finish with the poem in which he expressed his final wish. It's called The Testament and there's hardly a Ukrainian who has not heard it. When I die, then bury me atop a mound amid the steppe's expanse in my beloved Ukraine, so I may see the great broad fields, the Dnipro, and the cliffs, so I may hear the river roar. When it carries hostile blood from Ukraine into the Azure Sea, I'll then forsake the fields and hills, I'll leave it all, taking wing to pray to God himself. Till then, I know not God. Bury me, rise up, and break your chains. Then sprinkle liberty with hostile, wicked blood. And in a great new family, a family of the free, forget not to remember me with a kind and gentle word.